occurs is the improvement in the strike record. Time and time again, ordinary trade unionists have repudiated the advice to strike on the part of their leadership. Those of you with reasonably long memories may recall that it was the miners who, by striking, brought down the Conservative government under Edward Heath in 1974. Moreover, it was the trade union leadership, by creating in 1979 the winter of discontent, which brought down the Labour government under Jim Callaghan. But so far, Margaret Thatcher has seen off the miners twice. Twice during the last two winters, the miners' leadership have advocated strike action, and twice the membership has repudiated that advice and stayed at work. Realism is returning to the trade union movement in Britain. They have just held their annual conference in Blackpool. And the president of the conference, who is boss of the elect electricians union, told the delegates, and I quote, threats to destroy elected governments are not only infantile, but they are also a dangerous boomerang, alienating us from our members, as well as threatening the only type of society that guarantees our own freedom. As the London Financial Times commented, Mr. Chappell's speech was par for the course. Wholly unexpected was the response. It was not booed. Quite clearly, our unions now are adapting to the results of the election. They have to, because they know that very many members of their, very many of their members voted for Margaret Thatcher. They have to because they know that very many of their members repudiated the policies of the Labour Party. One of our most famous cartoonists of the past, David Lowe, used to depict the British trade union movement as a lumbering cart horse, not too bright and slow and clumsy on his feet. So we mustn't expect sudden or rapid change, but change there is. There is a movement away from too close identification with the Labour Party. The balance of power in the trade union movement and in its leadership have shifted to the right, and the moderates are once more in control. And this, I think, is a healthy movement because it has been dictated from the grassroots by the rank and file of the membership, who have grown sick and tired of the public posturing of some of their more headline-grabbing leaders. And all this is having a tonic effect on management. In June, in Washington, I opened the 29th International Food Fair. And I was talking to a British businessman who runs a food manufacturing business of his own. And one of the things he said to me was, managing a company has become enjoyable again since Margaret Thatcher came to power. In the short time that I was a free man, between retiring from Bonn at the beginning of 1981 uh, and coming to Washington in the autumn of 1982, I was on the board of a number of companies. I was able to observe for myself the degree to which management was taking charge again, with the result that over an 18-month period, the firms were becoming much more efficient. They were reducing overmanning, productivity was rising, they were getting ready with new product lines for the recovery in the market, and they were getting their balance sheets into better shape. There is a dark side. Unemployment is high, too high, no doubt about that. No one can take satisfaction in 3 million or 12% of the working population three million people being out of work. And I think that's about 2% more than here in the United States. But the curious thing is it has not become a political factor. A lot of pundits are punditing about it as to why this should be so. And since they are doing so, may I do so also and offer you my opinion. And I think the reason is first because people realize that the whole world has been in recession and that Britain, which lives by trade, cannot insulate itself from the world. Secondly, 
People have at last realized that they can price themselves out of work if they use trade union muscle to drive wage bargains which are not matched by greater productivity. There is no free lunch. And it is noticeable that management relations are noticeably better in the private sector, where bloody-mindedness on the part of trade unionists can put a firm out of business. In the public sector, still all too many trade unionists believe that the taxpayer's pocket is bottomless, and we still have some way to go to overcome that problem. Thirdly, while unemployment is no doubt psychologically bad, it is not associated with the sheer grinding poverty that it was in the 1930s. Fourthly, the message has got through that the key to employment is not the preservation of old jobs in industries in decline, but new jobs created by new investment in the industries and services of the future. Finally, and perhaps I ought not to say this, uh, the, what is known euphemistically as the secondary economy, the black economy, the economy unknown to the tax inspectors, the secondary economy in Britain is in pretty good shape. I should know, uh, because as a house owner in Britain, I could not do without it. Some people estimate the size of the black economy at 5 to 7 percent of the gross national product. As a result of all this, there is no doubt at all in my mind that British industry will come out of this recession more efficient and more productive than it went into it. It will be leaner, certainly, for only the efficient have been able to survive this recession. But it will also be hungrier, hungrier for profits, ready to invest, and better able to create new jobs. And that is the incontrovertible order of March. Profits leading to investments, leading to jobs, not the other way around. Growth has in fact already started. We expect about 25 to 3% this year. As a result, the British market will, in my view, become more attractive to American exporters and indeed to American investors who see Britain not only as an attractive market in itself but also as a springboard to the European economy. And in the other direction, British exporters will be much more competitive in the American market and British investors will want to invest here provided, that is, that, the, that unitary taxation does not, which is now fashionable in some states in the, in the Union, does not get too fashionable. For if it does become general, this will be a big turn-off for new investment. In the operation of the free world's open trading system, we are both partners and competitors. We are partners in ensuring that the system remains open, that the trade channels do not get blocked through protectionism. But at the same time, we are competitors in each other's markets. And that can only be good for all of us in our capacity as customers. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think you will find that Dr. Thatcher's medicine for the English disease is working. And that thanks to the good sense of my fellow citizens at the ballot box at the beginning of June, she now has another five years ahead of her to continue the treatment. I don't think that our American allies, trading partners and friends need expect any surprises from the new Thatcher government. Margaret Thatcher is pretty well known here now and people know what she stands for. She stands among other things for being a good ally in NATO, a good partner in the European community and specifically for being a good friend of the United States. Above all, she stands for freedom. Freedom implies responsibility. And she sta certainly stands for everybody's freedom to take their own decisions, to run their lives in their own way, and to take the responsibility for their lives and those decisions. 
She sees the government as having certain specific things to do because nobody else can do them. She, expects, she accepts the government's responsibility for the defense of our shores against foreign attack and the necessity for doing this with our like-minded allies and friends. She sees the necessity for the government, since no one else can do it, to be responsible for civic tranquility at home. Therefore, she will ensure that the police do not go short of funds and that law and order will prevail. She believes that the business of business is business and that the more government gets off managers, management's back and allows management to run its own affairs, the more prosperous the country is likely to be. She has already swept away a whole galaxy of controls, price controls, dividend controls, wage and salary controls, foreign exchange controls, and so on. She has already returned to private enterprise a number of nationalized companies, British Aerospace, Brit Oil, Cable and Wireless. And she intends, in her second term of office, to return still more nationalized industries to private hands. British Telecom is the most important, but there will be others. And those of you that wish to invest in Margaret Thatcher's Britain have only to lift a phone and dial your stockbroker. End of commercial. <laughs> but the British government will remain a caring government, for we remain a caring people. We shall continue to care for the young, the sick, and the elderly, and are ready to be taxed to do so. Altogether, I think we are in for an exciting five years. And speaking personally, I am delighted to be here in the United States explaining what we are doing in Britain and cooperating with the United States administration in safeguarding liberty and promoting democracy abroad. No British ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, in recent years can ever have had it so good. Your Excellency, we thank you for what was a most comprehensive and informative statement of the principles and achievements of the Thatcher administration. Uh, the ambassador has agreed to answer questions until 9 o'clock. Uh, I'll recognize you. Do we have a first question? Yes. Uh, th thank you for the, the very interesting speech. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the impact of immigration from the Commonwealth countries, particularly the African and, and Asian Commonwealth, on the British economy. And I'd also wonder, um, I'm interested as well, not only in the economy, but racial relations and what the United Kingdom sees as its obligation to people who uh, obtain citizenship in the, the um, British Empire prior to problems that, that came up, you know. Pr um, in the days before air travel, it used to be a cardinal principle of the British Empire and Commonwealth that everybody was a citizen of every country of the Commonwealth, and that meant, of course, that anybody who wanted to, from whatever part of the Commonwealth, could enter Britain without let or hindrance. And as so often happens with splendid principles, they can be applied as long as they are not uh, exaggerated. And with the advent of air travel, we found that so many people from so many parts of the world wished to come to Britain uh, that soon the island would sink. <laughs> so we had to put a embargo and greatly reduce the number of immigrants coming from Commonwealth countries. Nonetheless, in various parts of the world, there was a certain amount of human unkindness went on. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of, well, I'm thinking not least of Uganda in the times of uh, President Amin, when the population, the U Ugandan population of Indian inheritance, uh, came in for a very difficult time indeed. Uh, India did not wish to take them back because India had enough problems of her own. So Britain uh, met her obligations 
uh, and accepted the Ugandan Asian community, two, I might add, are very great profit. I think there's no doubt at all that over the years, the British experience has been similar to the American experience in that every new wave of immigrant brings qualities with them, not least the quality of wanting to get on and make a success of their lives, uh, which means that they are a very valuable addition indeed to the community. And the problem with Britain, unlike the United States, is that we have a very dense population. I mean in density, not in, in, in stupidity. <laughs> uh, we have, in a very small islands, we have 56 million. Therefore, there is a very strict limit to the absorptive capacity, both in t geographical extent and also in numbers. So we have had to reduce the number of immigrants. This has, um, and I think this has had a number of effects. First, anybody who lives in Britain uh, is, in, is a British citizen and is entitled to all the benefits and responsibilities of citizenship. There is no one disadvantaged on account of their country of origin uh, or their ethnic inheritance. Uh, secondly, I think we have found that it varies from community to community, but many of the immigrant communities have greatly brought great benefits to the British economy at the most sort of community level. Uh, the plain fact is that Im the immigrant communities from India and Pakistan are prepared to work so hard to get on that they keep their shops open later uh, than the ordinary department stores. And so most of my fellow citizens who happen to live in a neighborhood uh, where there are Indian shopkeepers find their shopping very much easier than otherwise. Uh, and if the Indian shopkeepers, in order to provide this service, stay open longer and perhaps charge a little more, and perhaps a cent a pound or something like that, then that is very reasonable price to pay for the service and additional service rendered. Of course, when new immigrants come to a place, and when that co coincides with a recession, then you have a recipe for a bit of spot and bother. And I would be the last one to deny that we have not had a spot of bother from time to time. It has been well publicized, so if I wanted to keep it from you, I couldn't. Uh, we have had trouble in Brixton, in particular with the West Indian community, uh, which were widely reported and intensively uh, investigated by a judge of the High Court. As a result, this was largely due to a feeling that the local police force was down on them and that the local white policemen would pick up the black boys uh, for no justifiable reason. I think we have managed to overcome this problem uh, by firstly by recruiting more black policemen uh, but also by the police force itself changing its policing methods. <coughs> and the encouraging feature, I don't know whether you want to make too much of it or not, is that the West Indian community in London every year uh, have a great three-day jamboree in Notting Hill. Uh, the first one, which I believe was about four years ago, caused a good deal of trouble. There was a lot of pickpocketing, there was a lot of aggro between the local West Indian community and the police, and on the whole it was not very happy. This last year, the whole thing passed off in an atmosphere of merriment and happiness uh, with the police force joining in the celebrations and I don't think any arrests were made at all. I mustn't uh, 
overpaint the picture. There are tensions in any community. There are tensions in any community where the various groups of citizens can be readily identified by the color of their skin. But I think we haven't done a bad job at all of meeting our commitment to our fellow citizens of the Commonwealth, of accepting them as equal citizens uh, in our country, and in enjoying a tolerable uh, relationship with them. I don't know how long this will last. I hope it will continue to improve. I wouldn't wish to give the impression that everything in the garden is lovely because with 56 million people something is bound to go wrong. But I think that the situation is very, very much better than anybody would have thought five, ten years ago. One member of parliament that may be known to you uh, said some years ago and got a certain amount of notoriety for it, he said that if our immigrant communities were not sent back to their homelands, that Britain would r run with rivers of blood. Uh, that, I'm glad to say, is a forecast which has not been proved true. Mr. Walren. I was wondering if you could comment about uh something I heard recently uh, in London f from a friend who said that uh, how can you justify uh, retiring an aircraft carrier before its replacement has been completed? <laughs> he, he, you know, when you are, have commitments in the Falklands and Belize as well as to NATO. Well, we, we um Point number one, we don't justify it, and point number two, we haven't done it. <laughs> and one of the consequences of the Falklands campaign is that we have had to uh, make modifications to the disposition of our armed services, and in particular, uh, alter, modify, not change greatly, but modify the role envisaged for the Royal Navy. What we have been doing over the years is really to concentrate more and more on our tasks in NATO. And for that purpose, our forces, whether Army, Navy, or Air Force, have been designed to operate in a NATO role. In a NATO role, it is very difficult to see the purpose of an aircraft carrier. Uh, and therefore, the tendency was that we would gradually go out of the aircraft carrier business. Well, several things have happened to make us change our minds on that, and uh, General Gautieri was first and foremost to be thanked for making us see the error of our ways. And um, because without the aircraft carriers Invincible and Hermes in the South Atlantic, we would not have been able to do what we did. I think a second thing has happened too, and that is that it has become increasingly clear that provided we keep up our guard and modernize our armaments and keep the seamless robe of deterrence effective in Central Europe, although Central Europe is the one place in the world where weapons are stacked one on top of another, uh, it is probably the place which is less likely to be the scene of major hostilities. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, Soviet opportunism, efforts to extend their power, project their power, is more likely to take place out of area. Uh, and therefore, we have come to this conclusion too. Uh, and as a result of both these factors, we are maintaining three aircraft carriers in service for the Navy. And that, of course, means that that is invincible illustrious and Hermes uh, and um, that means of course that they have to have their attendant nymphs, destroyers, frigates and so on uh, in order to guard them from the depredations of the enemy. And indeed at this moment in time uh, I think something like 38 ships are 
warships are now being built in British shipyards, which may not sound very many ships to Americans, but for us it's quite a lot of ships. Um, so to go back to your original question, we do not justify it. Uh, we don't do it. Uh, we have seen the error of our ways. Dr. Kimberly? Uh, can you see progress towards peace in Northern Ireland? Um, Dr. Kimberly, uh, would you repeat your question, please? Can you see progress towards peace in Northern Ireland? <laughs> yes. But that is a very bold statement to make. <laughs> given the troubled history of Northern Ireland, given the troubled history of Ireland, given the relationship between Britain and Ireland over the last 800 years, one would be a very bold man indeed if one was convinced that there was an early solution to a problem which has been going on for 800 years. That said, I think we are in the process at the moment of not solving the problem but managing the problem uh, better than we have for a long, long time. And I think there are many reasons for this. One of the reasons is that the Northern Ireland Police Force has become more effective. A second reason is that many people in the Catholic community in Northern Ireland are weary of the violence. And people known as super grasses are giving more and more information to the police so that more and more terrorists and I must add here on both sides of the conventional d divide Protestant as well as Catholic are being picked up arrested and brought to trial a third reason is that I think that most Irishmen and I think Irishmen in the north and Irishmen in the south have come rightly to the conclusion that the IRA is as big a menace to the future of the Republic of Ireland as it is to Northern Ireland and the reason for that of course is that the IRA is basically a Marxist organization uh, which not only wants to get the Brits out of Northern Ireland uh, but also to transform the whole of Ireland uh, into a socialist country by violence and so there is no doubt at all that the government in Dublin is as concerned about the IRA uh, as is the government in Northern Ireland And the fourth reason, bringing it closer to home to the United States, is that I think there has been a realization of this factor here in the United States. I think, although one hesitates to be too sure about anything concerned with Ireland, I think the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York this year may have marked a watershed. Because what was clear about the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York this year was that nobody in a responsible position, whether in government, in the legislature, Friends of Ireland, had anything to do with that parade at all. None of the Friends of Ireland were associated with it. And if you remember, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York refused to meet the Grand Marshal of the parade, who was Mr. Flannery, who was a self-confessed gun runner, uh, on the steps of St. Patrick's Cathedral. So I think, so I would hope, I don't know, 
I would hope that as a result of this, fewer Americans will be ready to finance violence in Northern Ireland. So I hope that this means that I think it's too strong a word to suggest that there is progress towards peace in Northern Ireland because that would assume a contented relationship with the two communities with different identities and different loyalties. I think we are making progress towards a reduction of violence. And, and the statistics show that, that progressively after the, over the last few years, few people, fewer people, men, women, children, policemen, soldiers, ordinary citizens, have been the victim of terrorist violence. We will just soldier on and try and hold the ring in Northern Ireland. We have proposed a, an assembly in Northern Ireland which everybody, including the Sinn Féin, are entitled to put up candidates for and have put up candidates for. But in that strange Irish way, they have stood for election, have been elected, and they refuse to take their seats. Britain cannot solve the problem of Northern Ireland. Only the people of Northern Ireland can solve the problem of Northern Ireland because only the people in Northern Ireland responsibly can decide what sort of society they want to live in, what sort of relationships they want to have with their neighbours. And so Britain is doing two things in Northern Ireland to help the people of Northern Ireland to do that if they wish to do so. And the one is, one thing is to provide through the police and through the army in support of the civil power conditions of relative peace and quiet in Northern Ireland so that people can go about their business in peace and quiet. And the second thing is to set up the representative institutions in Northern Ireland to provide for an assembly, to provide an electoral process, to provide that people of all political persuasions in Northern Ireland have a place to meet and take democratically, take responsibility for their own future. We cannot impose a solution on Northern Ireland. We have no desire to do so. Most we can do is to offer Catholics and Protestants alike in Northern Ireland the opportunity to take the responsibilities for their future. That is what we regard our task as being. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Since the United States and Great Britain are among the dwindling number of nations that have any respect at all for the individual citizen. And since this December is going to mark the 15th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Human Rights by majority of the United Nations, in fact, unanimous except for, I think, seven abstentions, the Soviet Union, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia. Do you think that this occasion should be used for a massive uh, effort in the United Nations to bring out the many violations of human rights that are going on all over the world and perhaps involve Amnesty International in the process. I have every conceivable sympathy with the sentiment that informed that question. On the record, I confess to a certain amount of skepticism that the United Nations as an organization can come good on its own resolutions. I think the best that we in Britain and you in the United States and in among our democratic friends and allies all over the world can do is to set the world an example, to ensure that in our own societies human rights are respected 
uh, to do what we can to protect, protect those nations where human rights are not uh, respected and on the contrary violated. But I don't think that we can be, hold ourselves responsible for those things for which we are not responsible. I am very ready to be responsible for my own life and I'm ready as a citizen to take co-responsibility for the sort of place Britain is. But we can't force our beliefs and our values down other people because they simply will not take them. So while I would wish as fervently as you do that the rest of mankind could enjoy the human rights that democratic societies offer their citizens, I think this has to be a slow evolutionary process and um, a vote in the United Nations given the present composition of the United Nations simply would not carry conviction and on the whole I am against political gestures that do not carry conviction so I think the best thing we can do is to continue to respect human rights in our own societies and demonstrate to the rest of the world beyond any reasonable doubt that this is the way things should be. And to judge by the number of people that seek to in come to our societies and enjoy human rights there, I think we're winning. The, uh, the ambassador has had a, uh, a long day in Baltimore. He's shared his time with all of us in the city generously. Um, I hesitate to impose on him longer, but he has uh, very graciously agreed now to answer one more question. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, I direct my question to you. It's a multifaceted question as one a student of international relations and one a United States Marine. Uh, it deals with uh, Britain's foreign policy. In the wake of uh, the Falkland Islands, the American people have viewed uh, Great Britain as being very strong militarily. Uh, Margaret Thatcher has earned the name uh, Iron Maggie. Uh, one of my questions to you is, does the Thatcher government see the world as being bipolar or multipolar? The second question is... Uh, I'm awfully sorry, I didn't catch that. Does the Thatcher government see the world... See the world as being bipolar, just uh, uh, U.S. Bipolar, against yeah. Russia or multipolar, meaning our third world countries. Uh, the second question is, does the United, does, excuse me, does uh, Great Britain defend U.S. Persian, mis Persian missiles in Europe? And three, how does Great Britain, uh, or has Great Britain decided to aid their multinational forces, the British forces in Lebanon? Um, question number one, no, we certainly see the world as multipolar, and I think that uh, our the way we handle affairs demonstrates that. The three most important organizations to which Britain belongs are first for our de mutual defense, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, secondly for our better prosperity, the European community, but thirdly, and here I come to really the sense of your first question, the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth is the world in miniature. It has 46 members at the moment, uh, the Commonwealth gained its most recent member when Princess Margaret, on behalf of the Queen, attended the independent celebrations, I think last Saturday, of St. Kitts Nevis in the Caribbean. So, the Commonwealth, of which Britain is a member, and to which Britain attaches enormous importance, uh, is the world in miniature. We value that relationship uh, and we certainly uh, cherish the fact that the Commonwealth consists of all colors and creeds uh, and uh, live together uh, happily. So we certainly regard the world as multipolar, if you will, as contrasted to bipolar. Um, now, your third question was about the MNF in the Lebanon, wasn't it? Uh, the second question was directed toward, uh, does Great Britain defend the United States placing Persian missiles 
in Europe. Ah. That was not um, true. Now, Britain is, let's get this quite clear, Britain is a partner to the joint NATO two-track decision of December 1979, whereby, in order to counteract the Soviet SS-20s, the Allies agreed on two things. One, that they would station certain intermediate weapons in certain of the stationing countries by the end of 1983, unless the uh, Soviet Union had agreed uh, to negotiate about those weapons. This is a joint allied decision. Now, the joint allied decision implies, as far as the stationing of missiles is concerned, the stationing of cruise missiles in Britain, the stationing of cruise missiles in Italy, and the stationing of cruise missiles and Pershing missiles, Pershing twos, in West Germany. Britain, so that I get the right sense of the answer to your question, Britain is party to the NATO decision which agreed that in the event of no progress in disarmament talks, Cruise and Pershing would be stationed in Germany. But, of course, there are no Pershings in Britain, never were intended to be, uh, and fundamentally the decision for the stationing of Pershing twos is a matter for the West German government. And the West German government of the day, both the Social Democratic government under Helmut Schmidt, which is now in opposition, uh, and the present West German government under Helmut Kohl, have agreed to that. We take, in a sense, joint responsibility that, for that because we uh, are parties to the whole of the uh, NATO decision. Your third question is about the MNF in the Lebanon. Yes, um, Britain has supplied a very small but symbolic contingent to the multinational force. It is very small. It is 100 men, which compares, I think, with over a thousand of both United States Marines, French, and Italian forces. The reason why our contingent is small is that because we have other out-of-area responsibilities, uh, like our garrison in the Falklands, like our garrison uh, in Belize, so that we simply hadn't the forces available to do that as well as meet our NATO commitments. But nonetheless, we wished, uh, we acceded to a request to have a symbolic presence there, uh, both to meet the uh, allied objective, if you like, of supporting visibly the Lebanese government and supporting the efforts towards reconciliation in Lebanon uh, and towards a ceasefire in Lebanon, uh, and also as a gesture of solidarity uh, with our American, French, and Italian allies. So it is symbolic, uh, small, but symbolic, but committed. Uh, we are as committed uh, to that um, purpose in the Middle East, in the Lebanon, to support the Lebanese government, to support a ceasefire, to support national re reconciliation, as anybody else is, even though our support is small and symbolic. D does that meet your questions? Uh, the question was directed uh, more to the degree of, would you back up your MNF forces there? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I, I think the, uh, he's adding the additional question of um, the degree to which uh, you are supporting or willing to support your forces which are in place, presuming some kind of demanded escalation. Is that yes. correct? In the light of them uh, taking casualties. Um, well, uh, the forces are there. They have their rules of engagement. The conditions under which they're there are the same as for the other ones. Um, uh, we accept the situation as it is. Uh, that, I, if one 
Um, perhaps if I could just, um, we must all go home, mustn't we? Um, everybody knows that the situation in the Lebanon is fraught with difficulty. Uh, there is a very small bit of dry land which Bud McFarland is trying to tread as he shuttles between Damascus and Riyadh uh, and Beirut. Uh, but all around that, uh, in search of a ceasefire, in search of a political reconciliation in the Lebanon, uh, in search of getting a secure Lebanese government based on the consent uh, of the people of Lebanon and with the support of the Lebanese army. But he has a monumentally difficult task. Uh, and all surrounding this rather small area of dry land is quagmire of every sort. Uh, because obviously none of us wish to get sucked in uh, to the Lebanon and to the Middle East problems. Um, but every, all of us are very well aware of the dangers of getting sucked in. Uh, but equally there is no conceivable Western interest in pulling out. And um, so at the present time, my government agrees with the U US government and with our Italian and French friends that uh, staying is bad, as someone put it in the Congress. I think, yes, this staying is bad, but getting out is worse. But um, just because there's a problem, it doesn't mean to say there's a solution to it. Mr. Ambassador, uh, I must apologize to the numerous people who, who had additional questions, to my colleague, Professor Gornick especially. I, uh, the applause, I think, indicates our, our gratitude to you for your presentation and your very full and careful and respectful answers to our questions. And we all realize the value of your time. We appreciate you coming to Baltimore and being so good about making this an enjoyable and valuable evening for us. Thank you very much.